Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. Join me as we unpack the inspiration, the intimacy and the ideals behind the much loved, much adapted, romantic comedy you could say, Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare. Now Shakespeare is in many ways a magpie in the way that he chooses the influences that resonate in each of his plays. And Much Ado About Nothing is no different. He's chosen from an eclectic range of sources, key moments of dramatic tension that he then applies and reworks to his own game in this play. One particular source that I want to draw to your attention comes from Edmund Spencer. It's an epic poem entitled The Fairy Queen that was actually written as homage to Elizabeth I, trying to prove the English Renaissance to be alive and well through a dramatic, mysterious, thrilling story of knights. But the particular subplot that I want to draw reference to has great parallels between the relationship of Hero and Claudio that we'll be exploring in future videos. Let me introduce Phaedon and Clarabelle. They are engaged to each other, but Phaedon is led to believe by his false friend Philemon that Clarabelle is having an affair. He deeply loves his fiancée, but Phaedon swings in his emotions from being madly in love to being madly enraged by this obvious act of deception as he sees it. Now Phaedon murders Clarabelle for her false nature and then later finds that Philemon had been lying to him. He then poisons Philemon. It's important to note that Philemon means self-love. There are so many layers in the works of Spencer. It's bizarre to think that Shakespeare could take such tragic elements of a subplot within Spencer's poem and then rework it into a much more light-hearted fascination into themes of trust, marriage, honour, virginity, the nature of how deception operates with almost a comedic edge. As we dig into the detail, I urge you to consider what Elizabethan expectations were of societal constructs like marriage and the patriarchal norms that embedded that world. And for you to reflect with me on whether this really is a comedy at all. The year is 1598 and Queen Elizabeth I is on the throne. She's been a huge proponent of the rise of English theatre, so much so that this time is often called the English Renaissance. Theatre going is a huge pastime and Shakespeare is a huge beneficiary of that fact. He's just had success in 1597 with Romeo and Juliet and now here he is launching Much Ado About Nothing. He's about to move on to more tragic plays in years to come, but this particular play attracts a huge amount of attention from the start. Now, the fact that theatre going has a huge amount of attention laid on it is in part because of the difference in opinion that the Queen has versus Parliament and the Church. The fact that 3,000 people can be in community together hearing ideas about anything other than God is a big concern for the Church in particular. But Parliament also have a huge issue with it. They fear that opinionated playwrights are bawdy and base in their views, so much so that actors are seen as being full of loose morals. So troops are shut down and theatre companies can be too if the words that they're sharing or the message they're conveying in their plays are seen to be heretical or against God or against the Parliament of the time. I have for you an image here of what's said to be the Lord Chamberlain's men. That's Shakespeare's very own troop at this time. They would have been quaking in their boots also at any given point about their material being shut down. There was all sorts of concern about anything other than the message of God being put at the forefront of individuals' minds. And theatres were often quite salacious places where all sorts of sin could be going on. 
So it's important to see that in the backdrop of what Shakespeare was doing, it was already quite radical stuff to be going to the theatre in that backdrop of fun and frivolity that seemed against what authority figures wanted. It goes without saying it was illegal for women to be acting in plays. As an unwholesome enterprise, it meant men played both male and female parts. Whilst Elizabeth I was on the throne, Women of this era did not get the benefit or feel a change with a woman monarch there to empower them. In reality, there was more fixation on what it really should look like to be a great woman. Wealthy families would read fashionable conduct books that sought to refine expectations and define acceptable behaviour of women. Academically, a gulf was present between how middle-class children were raised. Girls would learn, in the domestic sphere, how to run a home, cook and clean. They might learn to read at home if they were lucky. Whereas boys would go to grammar school and either learn a trade or continue on to further study. This gender disparity held women back as they were not considered capable of intellectual and rigorous thought. The paths for a secure future revolved around marriage for women, a central theme to the play. It provided a financial income and safety from squalor. Whilst women could own property once they were married, it would go to their husband. Note that women in these times would not be entitled to the same proportion of inheritance as their sons or brothers just for virtue of being a woman, even if the property was 100% theirs before they got married. So, some women tried to pass down inheritance to other women as an opportunity for financial independence in a society that was absolutely fixated on male success. Finally, an implicit overhang in the thinking of roles played by women in this time is clearly coming out of the Bible. It sets a precedent that the Virgin Mary proved to be an amazing and excellent mother as an innocent virgin. Yet, Eve and latterly Mary Magdalene were tempted by sin. So whilst women were expected to be pure, like the Virgin Mary, they were suspected to be sinful, like Eve. We see the dynamics of this at play in the way that Hero is firstly put on a pedestal as a saint and then brought right down as a sinner by the way that male characters in this play unpack her femininity all as a question around what defines her as a good or good enough woman. Elizabethans saw marriage in a much more pragmatic light than we do today. It was a transaction that demanded that you got a good deal. And whilst audiences would be fascinated with the notion of a love match between Beatrice and Benedict, marriage was a safe space to rear children. This famous painting on the bottom right shows the pride of two sisters with their babies. Sex was a preserve for the wedding day. And yet historians estimate that over a quarter of women were pregnant on their wedding day, like William Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway. So purity was bound in the notion of being seen to be a virgin, and society expected women to maintain and uphold this value. It was even considered to be a father or husband's job to control the chastity of the woman. Cuckoldry or being um, cheated upon by a woman and infidelity was a real threat at this particular time. So that suspicion of women being sinful like Eve is latent once more. It's also interesting to note the title, Much Ado About Nothing. When we take the original sentiment of nothing at this time it was noting that was seen as slang for sex so if it's much ado about noting 
there's an implication here that this play is definitely looking at sexual politics and the reality that marriage is the preserve for sex but potentially foul play happens outside of marriage. The power of this play to fill the hearts and minds of audience members through the ages with intrigue and joy at the revelry between Beatrice and Benedict is in part because of the way that those two characters merge comedy with their bold and stubborn traits. They define romance through their similarity and they ultimately love wordplay enough to make it witty too. It's noted that Charles I crossed out the title of Much Ado About Nothing and simply wrote in its place Beatrice and Benedict. To unpack the power of the relationships we get to explore in this play, we really need to zoom in on the domestic setting of Messina, Italy. A war might well be over, but the battle really is between Beatrice and Benedict and the rage between Hero and Claudio in the core moments of this text when she is accused of sleeping with somebody else. Even powerful figures like Don John seem entrenched in the romantic relationships between these four whilst being an observer. It's definitely tricky to not get caught up in this play, but it's certainly not much ado about nothing, even if you'd like to think it was much ado about noting. I hope you enjoy my videos that are to come on the characters and themes of this play, but more than anything, I hope this has set the stage and the scene for you. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?